Cilia are made from microtubules arranged in a nine dimers plus two singlets formation. In the last slide, I mentioned that dynein is used for retrograde transport along microtubules. However, it can also be used to bind microtubules for a different purpose, to link the doublets together, and use ATP to cause them to slide along each other, making the cilium bend. Cartagener syndrome, also known as ciliary dyskinesia, is a rare autosomal recessive disorder that results in immodal cilia due to a defect in dynein. This results in both male and female infertility, since sperm can't move, and the cilia in the fallopian tubes can't propel the ovum towards the uterus. Patients with cartogeners also have bronchiectasis and recurrent sinusitis, since cilia are required to sweep particles out of the lungs. Lastly, it's associated with situs inversus, which is a condition in which the major organs are found on the opposite side of the body. For example, the liver should be found on the right side, but here it's found on the left. There are three major parts to the cytoskeleton. Actin and myosin comprise microfilaments, and they're the thinnest structure in the cytoskeleton, with a diameter of just 7 nanometers. Actin is present in microvilli and adherence junctions, and actin and myosin together mediate muscle contractions and cytokinesis. Intermediate filaments are generally involved in cell structure and have an intermediate diameter of about 10 nanometers. Some examples of intermediate filaments include vomentin, desmin, cytokeratin, lamins, and glial fibrillary acid proteins, which are a histologic marker for astrocytes in the brain. We already talked about microtubules, but to recap, they're the largest part of the cytoskeleton, with a diameter of about 25 nanometers, and are generally involved in movement of things inside cells, or of the cells themselves. They're present in cilia, flagella, the metodic spindle, axonal trafficking, and centrioles. The plasma membrane separates the inside of the cell from the outside, and is also responsible for mediating interactions between cells. As you can see in this image, it's asymmetric, so one side may not look like the other. It's mostly composed of an even mixture of cholesterol and phospholipids, but also contains some sphingolipids, glycoproteins, and proteins. Some proteins are transmembrane proteins, which means they have an intracellular, transmembrane, and extracellular part. These include transport proteins and ion channels, as well as receptor tyrosine kinases. There are also peripheral membrane proteins, such as phospholipase C, which are anchored to the membrane either by binding to another protein or a covalent bond to a membrane lipid. It's important to know that hydrophobic domains of proteins will always be found in the transmembrane region, since they are repelled by water that is outside or inside the cell. Hydrophilic domains will be found bordering the cytosol or the extracellular area, or in the lumen if it's a transport protein. Another important concept to understand about plasma membranes is their fluidity or melting temperature. These two are inversely correlated, so if one goes up, the other goes down. There are three main factors that influence them, cholesterol content, fatty acid length, and fatty acid saturation. High cholesterol content, longer fatty acids, and more saturated fatty acids will all decrease the fluidity of the membrane, and therefore increase its melting temperature. When fatty acids are more saturated, this means they have fewer double bonds, so they can pack together more tightly and decrease fluidity. These immunohistochemical stains can be useful to memorize for some easy points on test questions. As I already mentioned, glial fibrillary acid protein is found in neuroglia such as astrocytes. Neurofilaments are obviously found in neurons, and cytokeratin is found in epithelial cells, which you can remember because the epithelial cells in skin are keratinized. Lastly, desmin is found in muscle tissue, and vimentin is found in connective tissue. The sodium-potassium ATPase pump is a transmembrane protein that helps to maintain physiologic concentrations of sodium and potassium in the cell. To do this, it uses active transport, which means it hydrolyzes ATP. Since ATP is produced inside the cell, it makes sense that the ATPase domain is on the cytosolic side of the protein. Remember, the inside of the cell is high in potassium and has only a small amount of sodium, whereas the outside of the cell has a lot of sodium and only a little bit of potassium. Therefore, the role of this pump is to bring potassium in and sodium out. For each ATP used, three sodium molecules are transported out of the cell and two potassiums are transported in. There are several drugs that inhibit this process. Oabane does this by binding to the potassium binding site and is used as a poison by hunters in Somalia. Cardiac glycosides are drugs used for arrhythmias and congestive heart failure, and they include digoxin and digitoxin. These directly inhibit the ATPase activity of the pump, which causes sodium to build up inside the cell, which in turn stimulates the sodium-calcium exchanger, which allows sodium to escape. Ultimately, this increases the amount of calcium inside the cell. More calcium in cardiomyocytes means more cardiac contractility. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. Its structure is a triple helix, which is rich in glycine and proline. There are four main types of collagen. Type 1 is the most abundant and is found in bone, skin, tendon, dentin, fascia, and the cornea, and is also involved in wound repair. Type 2 is found in cartilage, the vitreous body, and the nucleus pulposus. For type 1, it's mostly important to remember that it's involved in the bone, which you can remember because bone has the word 1 in it. 
Similarly, type 2 is mostly important for its role in cartilage, which you can remember using the mnemonic CAR2 ledge. Type 3 collagen is also known as reticulin and is found in the skin, blood vessels, the uterus, fetal tissue, and granulation tissue. Lastly, type 4 collagen is found in basement membranes or the basal lamina, which you can remember using the mnemonic type 4 under the floor. Can you think of some places in the body where basement membranes are found? Important ones are the glomeruli of the kidney and the capsule of the lens. We'll talk more about that in a minute when we go through the diseases listed here in more detail. The different kinds of collagen are determined by the different structures of alpha helices that make up each triple helix. Each alpha chain can range from 600 to 3,000 amino acids long, and the triple helices can be homotrimeric, which means they contain three identical alpha chains, or heterotrimeric, meaning they have three different alpha chains. Most collagen synthesis takes place in fibroblasts. There are several intracellular and extracellular steps that lead to the final collagen molecule. Protein synthesis, hydroxylation, and glycosylation all take place inside the cell, and proteolytic processing and crosslinking take place outside. It's important to know which steps occur in which subcellular compartments, and the particular residues that are modified are often tested as well. The pre-pro-collagen alpha chain is synthesized in the rough ER, and then hydroxylation and glycosylation both occur within the ER. Hydroxylation requires vitamin C, and therefore can't occur properly in patients who have vitamin C deficiency, or scurvy. Hydroxylation occurs on proline and lysine residues. Glycosylation occurs only on lysines, and is necessary for the formation of the pro-collagen triple helix. Nothing specific to collagen synthesis happens in the Golgi, it's just used to transport the molecule out of the cell. After exocytosis, collagen is cleaved to tropocollagen. This cleavage occurs on lysine residues, and then individual tropocollagen molecules are bound together, also with lysine residues. This results in the final product, collagen fibrils. Mutations in the enzymes required for some of these steps can cause diseases such as osteogenesis imperfecta and Ehlers-Danlos. We'll cover these in more detail in the next few slides. Osteogenesis imperfecta is one of the most common deficiencies in collagen synthesis, occurring in about 1 in 10,000 people. Consequently, it's also the most commonly tested. It's also known as brittle bone disease, since it prevents the synthesis of type 1 collagen, which is a key component of bones. Since there are several different genes involved in collagen synthesis, there are a variety of gene defects that can cause this disease. The most common viable form is autosomal dominant, but another form, called osteogenesis imperfecta type 2, is fatal in utero or shortly after birth. Patients with the autosomal dominant form can present with multiple bone fractures without a history of trauma, including during birth. This is often confused with child abuse, and you may have to differentiate between the two in your exam. Patients may also have blue sclera, which you can see in this image. Since the middle ear bones are required for hearing, patients may have hearing loss as well, since these bones don't form properly. Lastly, these patients have dental imperfections, since they can't synthesize dentin properly. Defects in collagen synthesis can also cause Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. This is most often caused by a defect in type 3 collagen synthesis, although in some rare forms it can be caused by a defect in type 1 collagen. There are several types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, all of which involve hyperextensible skin, which you can see in this image. Hypermobile joints, which you can see here, and easy bleeding or bruising are also common. This has much more severe effects than the obvious cosmetic ones, since it can lead to joint dislocation, berry aneurysms, and organ rupture. Depending on the specific mutation, it can be either autosomal dominant or recessive. The last collagen synthesis defect we'll talk about is Alport syndrome. This is caused by defect in type 4 collagen, which is involved in basement membranes. Unlike the other collagen defects, Alport's is X-linked recessive. Since type 4 collagen is involved in the basement membranes of the kidneys, the eyes, and the ears, Alport syndrome can cause nephritis, deafness, and impaired vision. This image shows a thickening of the glomerular basement membrane due to glomerular nephritis that can be caused by Alport's, and this usually causes hematuria. Elastin is an elastic protein found in the lungs, large arteries, elastic ligaments, vocal cords, and ligamenta flava. It's similar to collagen because they're both rich in proline and glycine. However, unlike collagen, it does not contain hydroxyproline or hydroxylysine. It's also similar to collagen because both are produced by fibroblasts. So how is elastin made? First, tropoelastin is secreted, and then it's cross-linked to other tropoelastin molecules along with the scaffolding of fibrillin. It's this cross-linking of tropoelastin molecules that gives elastin its elastic properties. Marfan syndrome is caused by a defect in the fibrillin gene and affects about 1 in 3,000 to 1 in 5,000 people. It causes bony elongation, arachnodactyly, hypermobile joints, lens dislocation, cardiac abnormalities, and aortic rupture. Normally, elastin is broken down by the enzyme elastase. To prevent elastase from breaking down too much elastin, the protein alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibits elastase, thus preserving elastin. 
If a patient has a deficiency in alpha-1 antitrypsin, elastase is overactive and destroys too much elastin. This is often due to a lack of alpha-1 antitrypsin secretion from the liver, where its accumulation can cause cirrhosis. This also creates a problem in the alveoli of the lung, where lack of elastin results in emphysema, especially in patients who smoke cigarettes, since cigarette smoke also inhibits alpha-1 antitrypsin. In this image, you can see normal alveoli on the right side and damaged alveoli on the left side, which is what emphysema looks like. A common treatment of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is intravenous infusion of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And interestingly, this also helps patients who have emphysema caused by smoking.